All right, perfect. Great. Thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it, Natalie. You're welcome. Thanks. All right. Well, then let's just jump right in um, because one of the things that I have found uh, and hosting this podcast is a lot of the people that I talk to have had their own airway journey or something that put them on this path. So how did, how did you end up uh, in your particular field? Um, so it wasn't personal actually for me at all. Um, well, and just, most people call me Nat. I'm fine with Natalie too, but most people call me right. Nat. So that's kind of, yeah. Nat it is. Um, cool. So let's see, my airway journey was not, was not personal. Um, I've been a pediatric OT about 13 years now. Um, and mine was because I kept wanting to go backwards and airway essentially is the source. Um, and so is the foundation of everything we do. And so I'll explain that. So basically okay. I, I, I knew, I always knew I wanted to work with kids. I wanted to work some kind of medical field and art, and I couldn't figure out how to meld the two and OT via a lot of trial and error. I discovered OT and it was the perfect profession for me. Um, but after a few years of building obstacle courses and messy play and all that stuff, I <laughs> yeah. kept getting stuck with my kids. Like I felt like I got to a point where I couldn't make things stick anymore. And I was asking a lot of questions and doing a lot of reading and I couldn't crack the code. And I worked with a student actually from a local university who had been from California, long story short, had worked in a clinic there and said, hey, have you checked this kid's reflexes? And I said, what are you talking about? And so she said, oh, let me explain it to you. So she gave me a little handout from her old clinic that she worked at. And within a week, I was devouring as much information as I could get my hands on mm. in terms of primitive reflexes, reflex integration. What does that mean? What does it mean when they're not integrated? All that stuff. Because in grad school, we just learn about how to check for reflexes in an infant, like the zero to 12 month range. And then if they're not there, you just check they're not there. Like that's it. That's just right. Like, it's basically for a standardized assessment and that's it. it. They don't talk about it as it affects the developmental trajectory at all. Um, and so that was a huge eye opener for me. And so that became kind of my obsession. Um, there weren't classes that were teaching this at the time. This was seven, eight years ago, maybe there really wasn't much out there um, yeah. in terms of, you know, easily accessible information. So I read all the books that were out there on primitive reflexes, all the articles that I could find. And um, I started to notice the patterns. And it really is just a pattern of movement that you're looking for. And you're looking for these patterns in kids. You're looking at what they should look like, what they shouldn't look like. Um, where are you noticing these um, inconsistencies or really just these patterns of movement and how they're affecting their everyday function. But then I came to realize after a few years of getting good at that, Mm -hmm. that everything I was working on with these kids from like a kind of home programming, just all the things that they needed to work on were things that skills that they should have picked up in infancy. And I needed to know more. I needed to know why, why were all of these kids at six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 coming to me with issues that should have been resolved or dealt with when they were six months old or three months old. I didn't understand why. What kind of issues were you looking at? So, so for example, I was basically, uh, in terms of integrating reflexes, all of those mm -hmm. should integrate pretty much, most of them should integrate by the first 12 months of life. And it happens if we naturally progress through all of the movements that our body was meant to do. We're supposed to turn our head side to side. We're supposed to look up and down. We're supposed to be able to track through a full range of motion with our eyes. We're supposed mm -hmm. to be able to crawl. We're supposed right. to be able to, and we're supposed to do all that typically. Um, you know, the, on all fours, that kind of thing. Um, and so what I was having to do with all of my older kids, well, really all of my kids was get them back on their belly. We were having to go mm. back to tummy time wow. and work skills that should have been acquired then. And so okay. what happens then is that's where we develop eye movements. Like that's really where our eyes start to separate from our body, not physically. I mean, we start right, right, right. Our <laughs> independently of our torso right. and our head. And we strengthen our eyes. We also work on convergence, which is watching something as it comes closer to your face and divergence and all of those skills. And then we get that when we crawl. But if we crawl kind of sideways or asymmetrical, that doesn't work well. Um, mm -hmm. So all of these skills that these kids, that I was having to work on, that I was seeing in these older kids were really skills that should have been sharpened in that first you know, really six months of life, six, eight months mm -hmm. a year. 
Um, and so I was having to go back and work in this kind of developmental phases first year with everybody. And I still do, but I needed to understand why I still was like, what, what is happening to our kids? Yeah. Right. Like, and yes, there's the back to sleep campaign, which as you know, you know, it puts babies sleeping on their backs, thanks to SIDS risk, all of those things. So that's definitely a huge limiting factor when it comes to movement and opportunities for movement with our children. So that plays a little bit of a role in it, but mm -hmm. I, I essentially went and I took the tummy time method class by Michelle Emanuel. Um, mm -hmm. That was my first intro to infant development. And it really opened my eyes to things. Um, it, that was what was available at the time. And so from there, it was a jumping off point for me because I took a lot of different classes. I took tons of classes on tongue ties and jaw stability and jaw movement and breathing and airway. And I took myofunctional therapy classes. I took everything I could possibly afford at the time. Um, and, you know, over the last, and that was about seven years ago ish, when I really started to dive into infant specific work. Okay. Um, and that's when I really started to understand the connection between feeding skills. So there is, so mm -hmm. I didn't want to be a feeding therapist. Feeding therapy was not interesting to me at all in the least. Sensory-based feeding didn't appeal to me. Um, but I, but what I learned very quickly was that feeding is a, it requires a whole lot of coordination, infant feeding, especially. Mm -hmm. And that's where we can start to see some of this coordination breakdown. And obviously with feeding comes suck, swallow, breathe, suck, swallow, right. breathe, suck, swallow, breathe. Mm -hmm. So breathing is a huge component of that. Um, and that's where I realized that in order to understand this well, I had to understand what was happening with these babies when they were eating um, and where were things breaking down? Where were these kids taking what I call developmental detours and mm -hmm. um, why? So yeah. I accidentally became an infant feeding specialist. <laughs> <laughs> um, totally not what I set out to do or become when I first became an OT, but it makes all my big kids make sense. Mm. If I understand the early few months of development, um, and what these babies are struggling with, and then what happens when they should be using these reflexes the way that nature intended, but what gets in the way, um, and why these babies are struggling so much and then why they take these shortcuts and why they don't crawl and you know why they just jump up to to walking um it just made it all make so much sense and so right. that's that's kind of my journey so i kept basically just kept going backwards um i kept rewinding and rewinding and rewinding to where to a to a level that at least i understand it right so mm -hmm. Um, could I go even further? Probably like cranial nerves are something that I'm starting to understand a lot more about mm -hmm. now. Um, but certainly haven't mastered yet. Um, you know, but again, that's another layer of understanding for me that I'm, I'm slowly adding into my daily practice. But, um, I'd say the last probably four or five years has really been me just practicing. I, I've taken courses here and there. Um, mm -hmm. but it's been a lot of practice and a lot of trial and a lot of error and a lot of me recognizing patterns. Um, and I've added some breathing courses there too, which has been also another layer for me to understand more about what I was seeing and why these things made sense to me. Like I could inherently see the patterns, but I needed to understand why, why these worked for these babies, why they didn't work for these babies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so this is where, you know, when I first started working with babies, I started working with a team. I was in Nashville, Tennessee at the time, and I started working okay. with team of local, uh, an IBCLC there and um, a couple of the dentists. And then I started developing, you know, my, um, my colleagues, my airway focused colleagues, I would say, mm. although at the time it wasn't even really airway. It was more like tongue tie focused because okay. airway wasn't really the thing that was looked at yet. Although we knew that that was coming, it was more, yeah, but that's been was, relatively new. Right. We were called, say airway. Yeah. We were called yeah. tie savvy clinicians, I guess, is yeah. the way that that was sort of referred to. Or if I was looking for people to join my team or to kind of vet them when I was, you know, meeting them for lunch or whatever, I wanted to know more about that. So there was um, a myofunctional therapist um, in Nashville who was starting a practice then, and she was, you know, diving into that world of airway um, health and development mm -hmm. as well. And so it was starting, it was fledgling, um, yeah. but it was all very new. Nobody knew how to talk about it. 
Um, yeah. And so, you know, that's where I started. So I built that team and then I opened my other practice in Atlanta when I moved here about three years ago now. Um, and then slowly built a team here too of by now, I guess three years ago, it really was more of an airway focused field, or at least mm -hmm. people were starting to call themselves that. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's still how I like to refer to my practice, depending on who I'm talking to and who actually understands what that means. Um, okay. Because that airway piece is crucial. So, I mean, I'm kind of jumping all over the place now, but I do work with babies still primarily, but I also have a caseload of older kids too. Um, and older right now, I think my oldest is seven. Sometimes I see teenagers, but not often. Yeah. Um, okay. But, you know, and a lot of them, some are referred to me from airway focused practitioners because they need, they've recognized a need, um, some sensory based needs or some postural based needs. And it is part of an airway journey that they're on, whether it's expansion, tongue tie release, et cetera. But mm -hmm. a lot of them are just referred because they're clumsy. They're having behavioral challenges at school. It kind of your more typical OT referrals, even yeah. handwriting, right? If I get a referral for a kid who needs help with their handwriting, 99% of the time, there's also an airway component too. Really? Um, yes. Because oh. when we don't feed well, and when okay. we don't breathe well as an infant, we skip motor milestones or we avoid hard things. Babies are really good at compensating with their shoulders and their torso. So we get all these tense babies, tense toddlers, kids that skip crawling. When we skip crawling, we don't develop the muscles in our hand. Therefore, fine motor skills are affected. Sometimes it's just, it's that simple, but it is all connected. It's wild. Mm. Um, and so yeah, it's really fascinating. Um, I would never, I, and I don't think in all the podcasts I've done, I've heard handwriting. And maybe, maybe somebody did say it and I apologize if I missed it, but it's that not is just so connected. huge that, yeah, it just it never would have occurred to me that there's something else to, to watch out for. And again, it's not handwriting. Handwriting is not, it is not a causation. There is a correlation, right? Correct. Yes. Um, yep. Because we are avoiding movement patterns that, were challenging from the very beginning. And at the beginning, yeah. airway was a dictator. Airway is king always, as you know, I, breathing yeah. is the one thing that, I mean, no matter what we have to breathe. And so a human being will find a way to breathe and almost always it'll affect their posture. Mm -hmm. It'll affect their posture because they are going to tilt their head, right, tilt their head. Their airway, or they're going to go yeah. back, they're going to arch while they're sleeping, or they're going to tilt their head Push forward their head. when they're walking. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's going to affect the way that they use their muscles, the the way that those reflexes will or won't integrate, and it's going to affect their coordination and everything trickles down from there. Yeah. So it's really fascinating. So that's what I love to do uh -huh. is kind of trace it backwards. And so over the years, I've started to ask, I've, I've essentially been working on more detailed questionnaires for parents when kids start with me. So I have my own airway questionnaire now, which is mm. pulled from a lot of different resources, but I found that no matter what, even if they're not coming to me for airway concerns, parents, one, need to understand that I'm going to look at that. I need to look at how their kid chews. I need to look at how they swallow. I need to look at how they breathe. That's so important because if their child yeah. is breathing, all the work that I'm doing with them, you know, once a week or the work that they're doing at home, it's not going to stick. They're not mm -hmm. restorative sleep, never mind, you know, the I mean, the open mouth posture during the day, all that stuff in terms of craniofacial development, it's all being affected. But um, it's a multifactorial approach. So sure. And then <clears throat> for me, there's so much in what you said that I want to go back to. So, you know, just yeah. kind of bear yeah, with yeah. me. I think I'll pause there. So feel free to rewind. <clears throat> yeah, here we go. Um, one of the first things that you said that I really just want to validate is because I personally think it's so important and we're hearing this a lot and people we, we talk to, you formed a team. Yes. It's not a silo. When you're looking at a child, you need this team because it really is collaborative and I just want to applaud that because that's that's massive and that's one of the biggest things we advocate for as do many of our partners um, and I think that's huge and it's because of people like you that we are starting to see that happen across the U.S. Um, so I think that's that's fantastic and you know parents listening that's something to look for because you want to give your child this overall comprehensive help and support system. 
Um, so I think that's massive. Um, one of the other things that I think is interesting is you, you I'm trying to remember how, exactly how you worded it. You just rewind. You keep rewinding. You know, and we hear this a lot. You know, it's also people are like, what's the root cause? Um, so I find that very interesting that your instincts were, we'll just keep rewinding, keep rewinding until you find something that made sense to work with in, the, in these kids. I think that's, that's right. pretty cool. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I just, yeah. you know, again, if it, if it's not working for me, then I need to figure out what works. Right. So yeah. uh, essentially being able to address the, yeah, I mean, if we can address the root cause, like if we can address the mm -hmm. chewing we can address the posture stuff, we can address their tongue, tongue position in their mouth. We can address their open mouth posture, their breathing skills. Then we can start to change that kid's overall gross motor posture, the way they hold themselves, yeah. sit up in a chair, all of that stuff. Um, and we can build the strength that we need to then integrate those reflexes to then do all the things that they couldn't first do when they came to me as a, as a toddler or however old they are. So yeah, Which it's basically awesome. just a function of, well, I mean, you can band-aid things to a certain extent. Like there's so many courses out there that teach reflex integration, but they don't actually really go into why they don't mm -hmm. go into why these reflexes aren't integrating. And so much of it has to do with that function or dysfunction in that first, even honestly, three months of life. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's and that, in utero, but we see well, it. Yeah. yeah, we can see it now in utero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I think it's interesting too, that you mentioned Band-Aid because there's a lot of that. And again, this is no knock to anybody. I no. swear I say this every podcast. You don't know what you don't know. This goes for parents. It also applies to clinicians. Weren't taught this in medical school but just giving them a pill and sending them on their way, this is not the way to treat things. Like you said, let's rewind, let's get to the root. And I, I think we're starting to see that more and more just kind of across the board um, from, you know, allied health professionals and clinicians. It's a, it's right. a new way of thinking, or I guess maybe it's an old way of thinking that we're going back to. Yeah. I mean, it's also daunting, right? And so a yeah. lot of therapists, and you probably were going to ask me this, but therapists, when I'm talking to colleagues and they're asking, how did I get into this field? Or how do I bring up this subject with, with my patients? Mm -hmm. um, when they're not here for airway focused therapy, right? I mean, they know right. something I do and I'm going to look at it, but like, how do I say, oh, by the way, also your child has a very narrow palate and we need months of, you know, therapy or, um, we need something else, right? We have to bring in other practitioners. We have to make this a team approach. Like this isn't just me. Um, mm. It's a lot more complicated than that. How do I? Yeah. How do you approach that without completely flipping out a parent? Because as a parent, I know my first reaction would be, wait, what? Right. Yeah. Right. Pinned, like right? I wasn't here for that. And so I always right. tell colleagues, like it's a dance. It's, is a dance because you have to, you have to get to know your families first and know what's their bandwidth right? Mm. Like I cannot dump this on a patient, you know, or a family like day one, unless something's glaringly obvious. And I feel like, okay, I'm willing to risk my relationship with them because this kid's health is in jeopardy, then go, yeah. I'm going to send them to the ENT. I'm going to send them somewhere. If I think they're, you know, obviously that always comes first, but it's not something that comes up quickly. I plant the seed. I say, I'm going to look at all of these things because it's connected. And, you know, the nice thing is I give them very detailed intake paperwork. So my mm. intake paperwork asks a lot about early infancy, you know, and if they, they're bringing me a five-year-old, like it, it makes parents think like, well, why are, why is not asking me these questions? Right. Like, yeah. so it opens a door for me to say, okay, this is where I'm seeing these connections here. And I might not talk specifically about airway stuff, but I might ask them more detailed questions about breastfeeding difficulties, you know, what was happening there? Why did they need a nipple shield? Why were they on bottles for so long? Was that something that they intended or was that um, a choice that they had to make because breastfeeding failed? It, no judgment, just, you know, right. you know just need about, to know sure. right, what happened, where were the challenges? Um, and so, and I've given them an airway questionnaire. I want to know all about their sleep habits. And so I've already planted a seed that I'm looking at this, this is important. And so even if I don't talk about it for a few weeks, um, I'm going to bring it back up once I write their evaluation. And I've, I've written up the significance of my findings in their report. And I'm going to let that parent sit on that. And then we discuss it afterwards and say, okay, so I think that in a referral to an airway focused practitioner, uh, here's the name of the people that I re recommend. Um, when you're ready to talk about it, I'm here for you, basically. And some parents will ask right away, like, ooh, I want to talk about this more. We've been mm -hmm. noticing that. I, you know, I don't like that my child snores. Um, I I thought that maybe that 
was a red flag when my pediatrician brushed it off, that kind of thing. Cause I hear that a lot, yeah. um, you know, and it's sort of just, I give them information. I open the door. I'm approachable. I keep dropping nuggets and hints, depending on what I'm seeing throughout my sessions and um, what I feel is relevant for that child. And then we, um, we just kind of, we approach it when it's time, I guess. Yeah. Meet them um, where they are, right? I, I definitely journey. have to meet them where they are. And you have to respect that it is a journey. Like it's not something that we can just go to the ENT, get our tonsils and adenoids removed, and then we're done, which is a right. lot of parents' belief. Most parents come to me and say, my child snores. And even before, and if I bring up, this happens to me often, actually, they, they go get, they go to the ENT, they circumvent my team. They go to who they're comfortable with or who their friends have referred them to, because mm -hmm. this is what they know other people have done. They get their child's tonsils and adenoids removed because it's a quick fix for them. Right. Things get better for a month or two or three, the snoring stops and then it comes back. It mm -hmm. always comes back. And mm -hmm. that's where we have a very gentle, I told you so moment. Um, and we sit down and they say, okay, so I'm noticing these things again. I think it's time that I make an appointment with your airway focused dentist. Usually that's how it goes. Um, and that's yeah. okay. They, they had to do what they felt. Exactly. It was right for their child. Mm -hmm. Right. And what was comfortable for them and what was within, within their financial means too, because that's a huge one. This can be a very expensive journey. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no shame in that. There's just... Right recognizing where they are, what they're ready to hear and, um, me serving as that resource for them. And I'm kind of like the quarterback when it comes to a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah. And we, we've so, heard that a lot too, from, from, uh, other occupational therapists, myofunctional therapists, it's you, you're kind of the, the, I like the quarterback analogy, but you're, you're this pivotal piece because you can shoot in we're several triaging. different directions. Yeah, yeah. And you're, and you're connecting everyone together. Yeah. We're really triaging like, and just, cause it really is the parents that, you know, we're the, usually the practitioner that they have a strong relationship with because they're seeing us weekly or on a very regular basis. We get mm -hmm. to know their families. We get to know their child and they trust us. They should. Right. Yeah. In yeah. my case, they do. Um, and so they're the ones that say, okay, you're the one, like, I'm going to go to you with my questions, you know? And so they, they'll, hopefully I am that sounding board for them and can steer them in the right direction. Um, and, you know, but then this, I started talking about this because you brought up about band-aids. Mm -hmm. that's, that's also like, sometimes we just have to do what we need to do to get through this stage or phase of life. True. And, you know, even if I'm not working with a child anymore, but they've, you know, they're on anxiety meds or they're on ADHD meds because, and we know there's a sleep disordered problem mm -hmm. at the root of all of this, but right now we are medicating the problem because this is how it's showing up. And this is what's within that family's bandwidth. No judgment. Like that's yeah. what we're doing. I'm meeting them where they are. We're working with the skills that we have right now and they have the resources and the information to do something about it later. And and I when trust, they're ready, yeah. yeah, when they're ready. And often I do have families that will email me a year later and say, Hey, can you give me the name of that dentist again? I think we're ready to do something. And and that's cool. That's fine. Like yeah. this is a, it is a journey. It is not it is a journey. Is easily fixed and quickly fixed. And even when parents mm -hmm. go and get like an airway scan or an airway focused evaluation, sometimes they don't do anything with that either for months because they're mm -hmm. not ready to, but they've got the information. And when they're ready, they will hopefully. So exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I'm glad you said it because there is no judgment, right. And parents take the guilt off because we're all doing the very best we can. We all know that. Right. Um, and it is, it's not us being all woo woo. Let's grab a trendy work, but it is a journey. That's the important takeaway. And everyone's journey is different. And you've got to do as a parent, what you think is right for your child, as well as like you mentioned, what's within your bandwidth, as far as time goes emotionally financially, you know, do the best you can. Right. Um, yeah. And I love that you're meeting them where they are. And that's huge. Um, you also mentioned tummy time. Yeah. Which I'll make sure I put a link to that episode because we did speak with Michelle Emanuel is a great episode for anyone that hasn't heard it, as well as a link to the first 1000 days. Fantastic book for parents to read, even if your child is older. Um, you know, I have old children still fascinating to read it and reflect back uh, again, not for parent guilt, but you kind of become aware of missed opportunities or, Oh wait, that didn't occur. 
let me see if, you know, let's, as you said, rewind and see if I'm seeing any of the fallout or the patterns or the repercussions because of it. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll a lot of time, that. yeah, a lot of times parents, when I'm asking them questions, you know, about patterns that I think that this child is likely falling into, I'll say, Hey, like, you know, how long do they wear a bib for? Like, oh yeah, mm. we, we went through three bibs a day until they were like 18 months old. And I'll, you know, and then they're like, is that a thing? Was that a thing? <laughs> that's a definitely that's a, a thing. thing, right? Like yeah. that's a thing. And that's one of those things that like parents, so much of this is normalized, you know, thumb sucking, yes. like thumb su sucking to the age of two, all the, you know, thumb sucking, uh, pacifier use, mm. you know, prolonged everything um, <laughs> in terms of oral habits. Um, again, it's normalized, but is it, it's indicative of difficulties or dysfunction. Just because it's common, it's not right. actually normal. It's not right. what so should be normal. That's where, you know, sometimes, a lot of times I am the person, the first one to point things out like, hey, that's maybe something we should dive into, or at least all of these, you know, by themselves aren't necessarily problems, but they are indicative of patterns that, mm -hmm. you know, or these clusters of behaviors or um, tendencies for this child to do that are indicative of things that maybe we need to look at a little bit further. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and I like that. And so you touched on it a little bit and I kind of want to go back to it because, you know, in previous shows, we've talked a little bit about primitive reflex and tummy time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'll definitely put links for anybody that missed those, but we haven't talked much about sensory integration therapy. Okay. Um, so um, just, you know, kind of lay it out for parents, you know, what is it exactly? And what does that look like? Okay. Um, it's a really good question. So, I mean, OTs look at eight senses, right? So we have our five basic senses. I mean, and really not just OTs, but developmental professionals are usually neurological professionals. Um, mm -hmm. We have eight senses. So we have our five basic senses, which is, you know, the normal ones, taste, smell, touch, sight. Um, what am I missing? Hearing. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's three others. So there's your sense of your vestibular sense, mm -hmm. so your sense of movement. It, it, we get a lot of information from our inner ear and our eyes. Um, there's your sense of proprioception, which is where you are in space. So um, you, your joints give you that information. It has a lot to oh. do with gravity and pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's what's called interoception, which is your inner sense. Like, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you nauseous? Um, do you need to go to the bathroom? Like that one, basically, that is really hard for kids when the other ones break down. But basically, mm -hmm. we've got this sensory system and that's what tells us how to do things, right? So it is our information receptors, right? So um, we are always taking in information from our environment and mm -hmm. making computations. And, well, some of them are reflexive and a lot more of them are reflexive when we're babies, um, and we are responding somehow, right? So you talk to me, I'm answering, right? But right. as an infant, we have these reflexes that work with our, it's called our sensory motor system. It's, it's our senses and our movement and how it all works together. So, um, and it happens in our brainstem. So, um, our sensory system is so important because it starts to develop in utero, especially our sense of touch and our movement and our um, proprioceptive system. Those three senses happen more so in utero than any others. Those are the most fully formed. Um, and our sense of touch is our very first one. Okay. Um, and uh, it's, it's um, our skin gives us that information, but our skin is also our largest organ. Right. And, um, when kids are born premature or when we have some kind of birth trauma, those senses are disrupted somehow. And that is a huge, those have everything to do with the way we feed and the way that we coordinate our movements later on in life. And so our job as OTs is to figure out where did this start to break down? You know, and we have to base it off of these behaviors that we're seeing with kids and then work it all backwards and try to figure out what, we need to do to give them what kind of information do we need to um, provide that person's body with to be able to then meet their sensory needs. Um, you know, and a lot of people assume in a lot of the ways that sensory processing is presented, there's like over responsive and under responsive. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand that you can easily be both. Um, you know, our sensory systems are 
very volatile. They change all day long. I mean, just like I explained to parents, like if you're driving in traffic and um, it's bumper to bumper and you've got kids screaming in the back seat and the, you know, the radio's on and all of a sudden your kids get way louder um, and then the song comes on and it's an ex it's an exceptionally loud song. Like all of a sudden you've hit sensory overload. Whereas right. if you weren't in bumper to bumper traffic and you were driving down a beautiful country road, the windows were open, none of that might've bothered you. Right. So mm -hmm. like same input, different, um, cap different abilities to process it. Right. And so right. as OTs, our job is to figure out kind of what that kid's threshold is, what are they missing? How does that inform what they're able to do and what they're not able to do. But so much of it has to do with our feeding skills as an infant too. Um, and feeding, again, sucking, swallowing, breathing, all of that coordination um, is, it has to work well for us to then get to the next level, right? For us to be able to do yeah. what we need to do. And so if it doesn't work well, if there's a breakdown somewhere, um, then everything else will be affected. The sensory systems happen informs so much of the rest of our development later on in life. Um, especially that first eight years, like we are mm -hmm. sensory sponges. Um, after that, we're still taking in a lot of sensory information, but um, a lot of our ability to process that has already been not solidified because we are a neuroplastic, but um, the first eight years the of the most is there. Yeah. Is this why you see um, volunteers come in and, and hold the preemies. They always have people, you know, volunteer to come hold the newbies, the preemies. Is this why, I mean, this is that sensory thing? Is that? Sure. There's a huge component. I mean, touch is, touch, the sense of touch is responsible for our sense of emotional security, right? So mm -hmm. kids that have, um, are excessively clingy, have separation anxiety, um, a lot of times have a poorly integrated sense of touch. And so they're extra mm. sensitive sometimes, or sometimes they need more. So those are kids that are often um, clawing at their parents a lot. They like to scratch or touch their faces. Um, they like to put their hands up their shirts. They are very, um, there's a huge physical component to the way that they bond with their caregivers, which isn't a bad thing to an extent, right? But right. sometimes it goes to the nth degree and those children have a hard time separating from their parents. Um, and sometimes there is a birth trauma or um, there is, you know, they were premature. There was a kind of developmental component in utero um, or during the birth process that happened to cause that. But sometimes we don't know. Right. Sometimes kids, everything looks typical on paper. They had a perfectly normal birth um, and, you know, everything went well, so to speak, but um, they're still wired a little bit differently. Sometimes they need more input than your average kid. And sometimes they need less, or they're just more easily set off by certain things. Um, and so I like to explain that to parents. I like to teach them about their child's nervous system, particularly, so they can understand what they need. What does that yeah. look like? Because some parents are not... Um, they can't read their children as well. And that, there's no fault to them. Like that's just not what they're good at, right? And they might have their own sensory needs, which is huge. True. Yeah. And so a lot of parents um, are easily set off, especially during that early infancy, that fourth trimester um, by certain things that can be, um, they learn a lot about their sensory needs during that period of life, um, but they don't know how to get their needs met. They don't know how to adapt their environment. They don't know how to do because they're in survival mode. Right. Right. So right. Um, learning about their own sensory processing abilities or needs or habits, et cetera, as well as their child's can help them too. Um, so That's a huge. lot of it is education, but I mean, the sensory piece informs the movement piece, which kind of, they go hand in hand. We can't do one without the other. So. Um, yeah. And that totally makes sense basis of that really. Yeah. So when you're uh, you know assessing a patient and you're putting together a program for them, for them, and I, and I know it's different, right? Every child's different. Every family's mm -hmm. different. What is that just kind of at a high level, just so parents get a good understanding who may not have worked with anyone like you before. What does that process look like? Um, so let's talk different ages, I guess. Cause I mean, okay. Yeah. Let's talk tiny. Well, how the little first. Let, let's the babies, let's talk with right? infants first. Yeah. 
Okay. So infants, um, let's say a baby, I don't know, three months old comes to me and they're having feeding difficulties. Um, one of the last thing I look at in my evaluation is their mouth. Um, even though that's the thing that their parents want help with, because I'm going to look at their body first. I want to look at all the systems that have been affected. I want to look at, um, I want to make sure everything that is, should be there is there. Um, and what I mean is I'm looking at reflexes first. I'm looking, I'm touching their feet. I'm looking at their backs. I'm, I'm looking for tension. I'm looking for symmetry. Um, so I'm, I'm watching, but I'm moving the baby. I'm handling them a little bit. Um, and then I'm, at three months old, I'm going to see, okay, can they, can they look both ways with their eyes? Can they turn their head side to side? Well, um, if one side's more difficult than the other, we have to work on these things. That's part of, that's going to affect their feeding skills. Right. Um, I'm also from the very beginning when a baby, baby walks in, when a parent walks in with a baby <laughs> into my office, I'm watching and listening for how they breathe from the very beginning. So usually they're sitting across from me on my sofa mm -hmm. and getting a history from them. And I'm watching that baby and I'm, I'm watching the way that they're positioned or postured in their hand. I'm watching their chest rise and fall. I'm, I'm watching the color of their skin. If it's changing, I'm listening. Mm. Huge part of breathing is listening. Um, you know, and sometimes I'll pause the parent and say, Hey, do they always sound like that? And the parent will say, yeah, I guess they do, but I've never really noticed. Like, that's just what they sound like. Like, you know, and then I explain, okay, we, we shouldn't really be hearing that all the time. But um, so there's, I'm, I'm looking at all of that first. I'm looking at the whole big picture first and how it's all been affected. Mm -hmm. um, looking at a baby on their left, on their right sides, on their tummy. Um, and I want to make sure, can they move through that whole range of motion um, that they were intended or that they should be doing around three months old? And if not, I'm going to give we're going to practice and we're going to move that baby through different, um, different movements. Some of it's assisted with me and, and I have the parents demonstrate and practice with me in my office as well. I work virtually a lot too. So the parents are mm. then, um, hands-on with the infants all the time. Yeah. Um, and I want to make sure that they're seeing what I'm seeing and they're feeling what I'm feeling. And then I, I'm going to make them a home program. So I'm going to give them, I don't know, four five, six little movements, activities, things to do with their baby, different ways to move them, um, to encourage more natural movement patterns, and usually a lot of strength building. Okay. Um, and so, and then I'll assess their oral function. Um, I'll see what their suck is like and, you know, can they suck? Do they have a phasic bite? What is their rooting reflex? Like I'm looking at all of these things. And then the last thing I'm looking at are oral structures. I'm looking for tethered oral tissues. I'm looking at their palate shape. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling around basically, but that's the very last piece of the puzzle because I want to see what they can do first. Mm. I don't want to be biased by what I'm seeing. Um, right. And, and that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Parents often come in and they've seen other professionals too. And I'll say, look, I don't want to see that eval right now. Um, maybe later I want to make my own um, observations and, you know, I don't want to cloud my judgment with that. And so, yeah, so that's kind of what an initial session would look like. Um, it's I call it a developmental feeding evaluation because it truly does look at all the systems. I'm looking at reflexes, eyes, breathing. I mean, and virtually too. Parents often ask, uh, you know, how do you do that on the computer? I'm looking for patterns and it's, it's not that hard. Um, and if I know, I've learned over the years what questions to ask. And usually those are really, really helpful. And how to get the right information out of parents too, but it's it's a lot of observation skills as well, um, and so yeah, and then you know follow up sessions with infants. It's a lot of okay, piggybacking. I I wait a couple of weeks till I see them again, and we're gonna build on the skills that now we've acquired, and what happens next. And so it's it's a lot of a lot of gross motor skill building um, because I work outside in, so we're working on the big supporting mm. muscles first. Um, the neck, the shoulders, you know, we're working on breathing skills in different positions. Um, and then we're also working on oral motor skills as we're ready to do them. Um, and how would this differ then from, let's say, I don't know, let, let's jump a little bit, like four or five year old that maybe comes to you. Okay. So that's a really good question. So, um, for like my older kiddos, I mean, I'm, you know, obviously I'm not moving them. Right. So they're moving. Right. Them. They're, they're reactive. It's a sweaty session. Um, but I'm, you know, once I figure once, once they trust me and I trust them and we have a little bit of a rapport, um, let's say a screening is when I screen a kid to see, okay, what's going on. I'm going to look at their reflexes. I'm going to, I'm going to get them on all fours. I'm going to see what happens when they turn their head different ways. Um, 
And mm. it's not hard to check. This takes maybe, maybe three to five minutes max. Um, it looks like we're crawling. It looks okay. like we're, I mean, it's really very, and then we stand up, we do some stuff with our arms. We turn our head side to side. We hold our arms. Up. It's it's not very difficult. We pretend to be certain animals. And I'm I was really- I going to say it looks more like play, doesn't it? It looks totally like play. Yeah. Um, and we- you know, I'm just directing it at this point. Um, and I'm going to always look at their eyes. So eye muscles, mm -hmm. eye function, that is a huge component as well, because eyes direct head movement. Initially, um, most of my kids, really all of my older kids have some kind of eye muscle weakness. And that's not because they were born that way necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's because they never used the full range of motion. They maybe only turned their head well to the left and then they turned it partially to the right and that was good for them. And they figured out how to roll. They didn't need to do that. And those muscles remained weak on that right side. Oftentimes yeah. there's a, there's a pretty significant difference between one eye versus the other. And a lot of them struggle mm -hmm. with convergence. So bringing eyes together here, which has a lot to do with bilateral coordination, the use of both sides of our brain and mm -hmm. midline function. So sucking breathing all that happens here in the center mm -hmm. and when we can't do things here with both eyes we get tired really quickly and we avoid stuff we tend to use one side more than the other okay. and so eyes are a huge part of my screen as well um and and eye muscles also can really show up when we have a lot of visual fatigue especially for older kids um as they start doing kind of more academic or sit down tasks at school or play groups, um, they can show up as behavioral issues as well, because now stuff's hard. Mm. And so sitting right. and looking at a book or sitting and looking at a coloring page for more than, you know, 10 seconds, like they're, they're done, they're out of there. Right. Um, but then I'm also looking at their posture. I'm looking at their core strength. I'm looking at their shoulder and neck strength, because those are things that should have, if they were, if they had that solid foundation as an infant, we should also still see that as a four or five-year-old, but usually they can't do a chin tuck when they're laying on their back and their heads hanging off the mm. edge of something. We have some serious weakness there, but they've compensated with momentum. So they just move really fast and they, and they can't sit that. still. They can't sit still because if they sit still, they fall over. Um, you know, wow. and so with those kiddos, yeah. So I'm looking at gross motor skills. I'm looking at reflexes. Um, the sensory stuff is a bit more nuanced. Sometimes I'll give them a questionnaire to tease stuff out to know what questions I need to ask up front. Um, but I'll often do a little chewing, um, swallowing assessment. We'll go and have a snack. Basically, again, just looks like we're having a snack, but I'm watching okay. like a hawk. Right. Um, oftentimes I'm filming so I can go back and look at it later. And um, that tells me a lot about their ability to breathe too. Because if we can't they'll they'll make that face when they swallow right is that yeah, yeah i watch how they swallow i watch how they're chewing um i'm listening and then we'll also do stuff where we get their heart rate up right so i'll have them run in my office i'll have them jump i'll have them do animal walks things where you know i shouldn't hear them panting at the beginning mm -hmm. at the end maybe but um i want to see are they mouth breathing are they nose breathing you know i'm looking at all that while i am assessing other things too. Breathing is one of those. It's always there. It's always underlying everything, but I guess I've gotten good at noticing when things don't sound right. And when things don't look right. Um, and, and often, um, for most of those kids, I'll usually get to a point where I ask the parents if it's okay, if I lift their shirt up too. And I, I at least want to see, you know, below their nipples, right. I want to see their rib cage. I want to see what's happening. And I get them, you know, laying on their back. And then sometimes I get them on their back over a yoga ball or over a peanut ball. I want to, are you watching their diaphragm at that point? I'm watching their diaphragm. I'm, I'm looking for their ribs. Do their rib cages wing out? Is, are they mm. asymmetrical? A lot of times there's an asymmetry there. Um, and I'm so oftentimes seeing some abdominal separation there too. So um, wow. yeah, so it's all just part of the package, right? Like none of it is super worrisome or like a red flag in and of itself, but it tells me a story. And mm -hmm. so I'm always trying to figure out, okay, like, why is this kid having trouble sitting like this? Why is this kid having trouble holding their utensil? Um, you know, why do they bear down so hard on a crayon? What, um, why can't they hold a quadruped, like an all fours position for longer than 10 seconds without falling over? You'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. Most really struggle in all fours. Really? Yes, really. Wow. Their legs, they fall over, they're silly, all the things. Like it's really difficult for kids, especially if crawling was difficult as a baby. Um, mm -hmm. 
Oh, so, I mean, that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I like you, you, I think it was something when we were emailing back and forth and you mentioned, you know, part of what you, you just connect the dots. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think for me as an OT, I realized like, you know, it doesn't matter what I do in my sessions if what I'm doing doesn't make sense to the parents or the caregivers there. So it's all about education and explanation. And really I have to illustrate they, they need to be able to see what I'm seeing. Like, yes, I can look at, I can see it, you know, in two seconds and I can make these assessments and I can understand, okay, oh yeah, that, sh that shouldn't look like that, or that shouldn't be there. That's dysfunctional. But if the parent doesn't understand what I'm seeing, then the buy-in isn't as good, first of right. all. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to understand why I've asked their kid to, you know, um, do bear walks at home. Like, why is this important as opposed to like, okay, I said do it, but I want them to understand what we're trying to get out of the task mm -hmm. um, because they need to understand, like, it's just the more understanding there is, the more comprehension, the more um, everybody's on board, truly. I was going to say the more compliance, right? Yeah, when you the more understand compliance. it as a parent, then you're going to, okay, I can make this mm -hmm. fun. We're going to go do the bear walks. Let's do it. Well, and what's really cool is, you know, I'll get a, well, it works both ways. So I have infants in my office and they oftentimes have toddler siblings or older siblings. And the parents, as I'm explaining things, the parents are going, do you see three-year-olds? <laughs> can I bring my three-year-old? I have some questions. Is that okay if I ask? And I love them to ask because yeah. that means they're connecting the dots and that's their frame of reference. They might, this is kid number two. And so they only have kid number one to compare it to. And maybe they also had a bit of a shaky foundation as well. So their, their sense of normal um, or typical isn't the same as mine. Right. And so yeah. I need to know what they're, yeah. I mean, where are they starting from? How do they mm -hmm. understand this? Uh, what's normal to them? But then also it works both ways when I have, you know, maybe the three-year-olds in here and um, somebody, you know, a friend of a friend referred them to me to bring their three-year-old in because they were having difficulty chewing or they were too rough on the playground or something. And then suddenly they say, oh, you know, so they might have an infant at home as well. Um, now they're thinking, ooh, I, I, maybe we need to bring that child in for not to evaluate because these things, you know, as I'm explaining, okay, these things should have happened early on, did they crawl well? Did they, you know, they struggle with nursing, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. and you've got a nursing infant at home, the parent starts to connect the dots and think, oh yeah, maybe we need to look further into this. I mm -hmm. love that. Right. And then yeah. also, and then I get the parents that ask questions about themselves too. Um, but again, that's yeah. really important because it's not like we can just look at this in a bubble. I want them to understand how this is affecting everybody. I'm mm -hmm. changing their lens and it's really helpful. And, so. the, and that's fascinating. And I'm not fascinating. I mean, it's fantastic because they're definitely on board. They're open to learn. And now you have a collaboration, not just with your medical allies, but now you have a collaboration with the parents. Yeah. Uh, and I love it when they're like, massive. ooh, I'm going to go explain this. I need, I need my husband to talk to you. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. love, I love that when they get the whole family on board and everybody's yeah. looking at their own airway issues. And oftentimes they do, they go, they run in families. Yeah. And the parent, but the parents then go get their own evaluations. And that makes yeah. me happy because truly they're, they're seeing the value, right. In my mm -hmm. work, not just my work, it's not about me. It's about the value and what we're doing. Right. And, right. and this is important from a longevity standpoint. Truly. Well, sure. Yeah. It's going to impact their health span and their life, right. and which is amazing. And it's one of those things that I don't care how old you are. Once you see it, you cannot, you understand. can't, you can't unsee no. it. I have stood in line with my children and I get this, oh, like, please don't, please don't. <laughs> I know. I see that child. Please don't. All right. All day long. Because Yeah. Because now they're tiny little advocates, like running amok with their friends. You're a mouth breather. Oh, you blah, blah, blah. You know, so, but once you see it, you can take ownership of it and you can share with other people and you can save more people. So, yeah, and just you know, be that and, resource to steer people in the right direction when they're ready. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. When they're ready. I love yeah. that so much. Well, I cannot thank you enough for being on here. And, and typically at the end, and we've covered so much. Um, so I'm going to put you on the spot now. Um, sure. At the end of an episode, I always turn it back over to my guests to let you have final thought for our parents Ooh. okay yes definitely on the spot um <laughs> definitely on the spot final thought just i guess trust your gut as a parent don't be afraid to ask for help um and you know e even like i i'm on instagram a lot lately and i love that parents you know the 
don't be afraid to reach out to professionals and ask them questions. Uh, we're all just you know, on our own journey too, and truly here to learn with you all. And I think mm -hmm. that, um, you know, and if, if it's a question where you feel like, okay, maybe this is something, you know, this is a very involved question. Um, I'm going to say, maybe we need to book a consult, or maybe you need to ask this person because this isn't in my wheelhouse, et cetera, but we'll at least refer you to the professional that can give you the best answer, but don't be afraid to ask, ask the questions. Um, and, the earlier you deal with this stuff, the better, truly, because the longer you wait, the more habits you have to undo. So, um, yeah. but it, but at the same time, in the other regard, we can still deal with this later on as well. Yeah, so it's never too late. No, and we can do it in phases. If it seems overwhelming, you know, and bite off a little bit at a time, that's okay too. We can make really long-term plans. So that's awesome. Well, yeah. thank you so much for coming on today. I really You're appreciate it. Thanks for it. having me.